Hi, I'm Mary Harrell for Tan Books. Questions for all you stay-at-home moms or work-at-home moms or just moms in general out there. Do you ever feel just a little bit isolated? Maybe like your work goes largely unseen at best and totally unappreciated at worst. Do you wish there was someone you could talk to about these feelings, not in a nagging, griping kind of way, but in a real heart-to-heart -heart struggle about your vocation? Well, Dr. Mary Elizabeth Cuff has taken that exact conversation and put, put it into a beautiful new book, and she's here to tell us all about it today. Mother to Mother, Spiritual and Practical Wisdom from the Cloister to the Home is out now from Tan Books. Mary, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me come on. Mary, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how did you come to meet all these wonderful women in your book and tell us a bit about the actual process that inspired this book and the basis of these conversations and who these mothers actually are. Sure. So uh, my background, um, I'm a mom of five. I have uh, five ranging from eight to I think she's six and a half months now, but we kind of lose track of these things. <laughs> um, and um, my, my background before that is I, um, I used to teach um, at the university level uh, before uh, kid number two showed up and my husband and I looked at each other and said, I think maybe I need to stay home. I think that works better for, for our family. Um, and I haven't had any regrets uh, with that decision. Um, but uh, so that's kind of my background in, in a Two second uh, in a two second flyover, but um, who are these mothers that I talk to? Well, it started off like this: the idea for the book and the these mothers that that I ended up talking to um, uh, originated a playground. Uh, but uh, what happened was a bunch of my mom friends and I were hanging out at a playground. Uh, all of our kids were were playing together, and we were talking. And all of a sudden, a Capuchin nun walks over to our group. You never see Capuchin nuns at a playground. It just doesn't happen. So she and I started talking. And uh, she, she kind of looks around at all the kids at a certain point And she says, you know, cloistered nuns, contemplative nuns are the stay-at-home moms of the religious world. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, you're so right. I never mm -hmm. thought of that before. I wonder what else we have in common. <laughs> and so thus, uh, thus started off my attempt to uh, talk about motherhood with contemplative nuns. Um, I have uh, the Gower Benedictines uh, from Gower, Missouri. I have Cistercians from up in Wisconsin. I have Port Clares in Roswell, New Mexico, Capuchins from here in Pennsylvania, and Byzantine Carmelites also from here in Pennsylvania uh, that I met through the course of working through this book. And that's, that's how I met them. Um, was seeking the answer to the question, what else do contemplative nuns and moms have in common? The idea that stay-at-home mothers and cloistered nuns have a life that greatly corresponds was such a revelation to me. And um, it, the book was totally not what I thought it was going to be. I thought it would truly be some sort of theological treatise that would be, be beyond my daily reading level, you know, in the <laughs> eight minutes you have between like bath time and frantic bedtime. Right. It was totally accessible. It was beautifully written. And I dog-eared and underlined my copy into oblivion. I'm embarrassed to loan it out to people because of all my <laughs> notes. But um, what other feedback have you gotten from moms? who you've shared, like the idea of the book or who have it in their hands, uh, have you heard them say that same thing of, that's mind blowing that we have so much in common? Yes, every mom I've, I've mentioned the book to gets excited and says, wow, I, I can either see the parallels or other moms say, I can't wait to find out what those parallels are because I can't see them. Um, <laughs> which, you know, makes sense, right? Because you think, okay, contemplative nuns, it's very quiet, very orderly, and that's not my life at all. So I, I don't know when the last time it was quiet around here was, right? Like, what do I have in common with a contemplative nun, right? So, um, but everyone's been very excited about the idea. Um, the, the few that have, have read it so far um, have given me some great feedback. Um, actually, I was just on the phone yesterday with a friend of mine who's not a mother yet. She's engaged to be married, she'll be married in October. And she said that 
the reflections on vocation and what it means to commit yourself to a vocation as a woman, right, um, has really been helping her in, in her engaged life um, as she gets ready for marriage. You know, these questions, um, even, you know, tensions and vocations start, start, you know, early, right? And, you know, it doesn't mean your vocation isn't, isn't your vocation. It means that, you know, we work out our vocations throughout our whole lives. And she's been noticing certain tensions that she said that this discussion um, in the book helped her kind of start begin, begin to sort through and to, to make sense of. And she's not a mom yet, right? She's not even married yet. And that, that was really uh, good to hear that, that, that people are, are finding that it is helping them in their vocations already. That's mm. what I hope for. <laughs> Absolutely. I, and I was blown away just by some of the details about religious life and these various uh, religious orders. I didn't know. I think it was the, was it the Benedictines, the Gower Benedictines who take a vow of, it's, it's, it's not stability. What is it? The vow where they say they are not going to try and move somewhere else, right? They're going to stay with that order. What was that called? Right. I believe it is the vow to the Benedictine way of life. I think that's every Benedictine order has it or Benedictine monastery has kind of like a slightly different way of, of, of phrasing it. At least I'm, I'm no, no expert on, <laughs> on that, but it seems like it's a vow to the Benedictine life. And that means, because there's many different types of uh, cloister for, for nuns, right? Um, you get the, the Carmelites and the poor Clares, they have strict uh, enclosure where they don't come out. You see them through the grate, Right, that's the strictest form. The Benedictines have, I think it's called a uh, constitutional uh, cloister, where basically the idea is you stay home unless there is a good reason to be out. <laughs> um, and so the idea, actually the idea that they all have, all these orders, is that the convent you enter is the convent you will be buried at, um, unless God has called you to become a foundress um, in that very rare circumstance where you know, they go out and they form a new monastery someplace, which one of the nuns in the book actually was a foundress. She started off as a um, normal Carmelite, Discalce Carmelite, and in the 60s was called to found the one and only Byzantine Carmel in the world. Um, and so parts of her story as a foundress are kind of laced throughout her answers in, in, uh, in the questions of, of my book. I thought the book did an amazing job of humanizing those women that we think of as being so far removed from our life and even saints that you think these women could easily be canonized saints someday, some century in the future, um, that they are women who had to discern to be exactly where they were, to give up what they wanted to follow the Lord. I, all of it, I thought it was such a beautiful read, Mary, what you've done here. Uh, Mary, as you said, I think your youngest six and a half months. That's pretty yes. darn small. That's pretty <laughs> tiny. How do you, in writing this book and collating all their responses, how did you further strive to sanctify your own little home life, your own home hours with all those little ones and all their needs? Yes, actually, the book was wonderful in helping put a lot of things in perspective. Um, you know, the nuns are actually very busy, very busy women. You don't maybe think of that, right? You're like, well, what do they have to be busy about? They're just, you know, in, in the chapel praying all the time. No, that's what we see of their lives. They're very busy. They're keeping this huge ship of, of you know, the monastery afloat. Um, the cooking, the cleaning, the, you know, the caretaking, all of the things that go into that, right? It's very much like a home. And so their reflections on how they handle the busyness of their lives kind of helped me put into perspective the busyness of my life, right? And the fact that sometimes I find I see busyness as an obstacle to my vocation. Like, ah, if only the laundry pile weren't this big, I could actually do some mothering, right? And, and their perspective is, no, that laundry pile is part of the vocation. Maybe not my favorite part of the vocation, but oftentimes your, your less than favorite parts of your vocation are the parts where you have growth, right? Um, or an opportunity for growth if you let it. They're not automatic growth. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to see that moment as a moment of grace uh, or potential grace and you have to act upon it and accept it, right? A lot of acceptance goes into 
the cloistered vocation, it also goes into the vocation of motherhood. There's tons of things that are outside of our control that we are called to respond to, right? Um, and the way we respond to them is either vocationally or uh, grumpily, angrily, frustratedly, right? Um, and so as, as the nun's answers started coming back to me, I was able to visit one monastery in person, um, but the others, uh, we corresponded uh, via uh, the mail. Um, so as their, as their responses came back to me, I, eagerly I'd rip it open and go, okay, I know something in here is going to help me with something that I'm struggling with today because they always just seem to like come right at the right moment that I needed uh, to hear that. Um, so that, that was beautiful. Did you really correspond by paper mail as opposed to email with them? I corresponded with email with two of them, uh, paper mail uh, with two of them and in person with one of them. Um, and let me That's tell you, so nuns beautiful. have the most beautiful handwriting. Oh. I don't know how they do it, but right. it's beautiful. <laughs> oh. We corresponded with a um, uh, one of the Dominican sisters from Ann Arbor that uh, was at our parish school for a while. And the same, her penmanship, beautiful. I, I keep I keep them. I think they're going to be, you know, like relics, first class, second class someday, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, what were some of your favorite responses? I think you, you might have shared one or two already, or favorite discussions or topics with the religious mothers. I would say one of my um, favorite responses you recorded in the book was one of the sisters relaying, I think, a story about someone else saying that mothers have to wake up and, and say, I want to live in a happy home today, or I, I want to build a happy home today. And that has stuck with me so much. But what was one that stayed with you? Well, I have a, a baby that is, uh, you know, stalwartly refusing to sleep through the night. And every time I think she's about ready to, she uh, decides to take it back a notch and wake up even more. And uh, one of the nuns gave me the advice to um, use uh, babies waking up at night as a form of contemplation, right? You're up at night. It's kind of like a nun being up um, doing the various hours of prayer um, at night. Uh, mine are less scheduled than theirs are. But she said, just contemplate the face of Christ in the face of your baby. And that has turned kind of like, a, oh, really not again? You're awake again into a moment that I can actually use for more than just, um, you know, taking care of a baby, which is already a good thing on its own. Right. But it is a, a transcendent moment now where it's like, oh, I'm being called to pray in this moment um, for something. And I've started picking out different prayer intentions that I've, you know, heard of that, you know, that every time I wake up with a baby, I think, okay, this is for that person. And now I will use this as a moment of contemplation, right? And you can see the face of Christ in your children. It's there. It's there very obviously. And late at night when it's just you and them, you can see it very, very clearly if you're looking for it. It beats scrolling Instagram, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> not that I do that ever, right? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Mary, last question for you so you can get back to all those wonderful kids. As a mom with so many littles, how did you find the time and the discipline to write this beautiful book? Well, um, how did I? <laughs> I started writing it shortly after the birth of my fourth, and I finished it uh, shortly before the birth of my fifth. Um, so I've kind of got two babies that bookend the book uh, very fittingly. Um, how did I find the time? Well, you can do a lot in a little bit amount of time, which is something the nuns kept reiterating. You can fit a lot of prayer into tiny little corners of the day. You can also fit a lot of writing and thinking into the tiny little corners of the day. We are very busy, but when we think about the places where we are busy and the places where we're kind of wasting time, it's amazing how much time I find, speaking just for myself, I'm like, oh, I, I could have done something in that moment. And instead I, I didn't, right? And so trying to be more conscious of my time um, helped with, with that. Um, I did a lot of writing when the kids went to bed. Sometimes my husband and I will sit up, 
you know, have a glass of wine. He works on his project. I work on my project. We sit next to each other. It beats watching TV shows. <laughs> um, and we talk about what our projects are, you know, so that's, that's, you know, part of how I did that. Part of it too, I like to show my kids that it's good to have a life of the mind. And so it's okay to work a little bit on projects in front of them, right? Um, we homeschool. So I am making them work on school projects in front of me. And I think it's a good thing to model working on projects in front of them so they can kind of see, you know, why do I have to work on learning how to read again, mommy? Oh, because when you're an adult, you can do things like this, which, you know, they might say, okay, but I don't want to do that, right? But over time, you know, I want them to think of, of mommy as someone who, who thinks about things and tries to cultivate a life of the mind. Because, and it's something I insist upon them as well, that they cultivate this because it's good for us. You know, God gave us minds. He wanted us to use them for reflection. Uh, he wanted us to use our talents. And so I want them to see me using mine. Um, and I want to see them using theirs. So every once in a while, by the sandbox, I'll pull out my notebook and be like, all right, I'm going to write for a bit, kids. And if you have a question, ask. <laughs> if not, <laughs> Go play. <laughs> if it's not water vomit, you'll be fine. I promise. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're so glad you found those little pockets of productivity mm -hmm. and set that model for your kids because you have given a real gift to every Christian mother to the A. Again, the book is Mother to Mother Spiritual and Practical Wisdom from the Cloister to the home. You can find it now at tanbooks.com or ask about it at your local Catholic bookstore. Mary, congratulations. Well done. Beautiful project. And thanks so much for making the time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.